All right, well, good morning and welcome to our event today on Compass at PSI. Uh, we've been working on this for two years now, so a lot of people are very excited. This is the kickoff event, uh, so this will be rolling out statewide. So we want to make sure that everybody has all the information that they need, whether you're here uh, in person or you're watching uh, online. My name is Chris Gouts, and I'm the spokesman for the Michigan Department of Corrections. But enough about me. I want to thank those who are watching uh, online and those who are in attendance today. We have uh, judges, prosecutors, defense attorneys from all over the state uh, watching online. I also uh, heard that the entire uh, bench from Isabella County is watching online, so fire up chips. We thank you for watching. We also have staff from the Wyoming and Wisconsin Department of Corrections uh, watching, so very exciting. We have people from all over the country uh, tuning in today. Uh, you are all very busy and important people, so we're going to roll through this as quickly as we can and get you all the information that you need and hopefully get you out of here. Well, we will get you out of here in two very short hours. So we've got a very great and informative event. We have uh, three really great presenters. Um, if you are in the audience, you can write down your questions and we'll collect them and we'll do a Q&A session at the end. If you are watching our live feed, you can email your questions to mdoc-compass-psi-pilot at michigan.gov. I'll go over that again since it's a very easy email address. mdoc-compass-psi-pilot. Now, if you don't get to your question, uh, please know that somebody much smarter than me will be answering all of the questions that are submitted and will be posting those online as well as the video from today's presentation. So let's get right to it. Our first presenter is Dr. Timothy Brennan. Now I've got your bio right here. You've really done all of this stuff? Uh, Dr. Brennan is probably best known for his book on the social psychology of runaways and his chapters on criminological classification in criminal justice annual reviews. He was honored with the 2007 Warner Palmer Prize by the American Society of Criminology for his contributions to offender classification and differential treatment. His work has been reported on the BBC, NPR, ABC's TV's 2020, Psychology Today, and other popular media. Have you ever been on C-SPAN? I've been on C-SPAN. Oh, I'm sorry, this is popular media, sorry. So Dr. Brennan received his PhD from Lancaster University in England in 1972 and was formerly an associate research professor and associate of the Institute of Cognitive Science at the University of Colorado. He has been the chief scientist of North Point Institute uh, for Public Management since 1989. He was elected to the board of the North American Classification Society and has chaired several national conferences on classification and assessment. So please help me welcome to the stage, Dr. Brennan. I just have to quickly retrieve my, my watch, which is in my pocket here, because I've got to go through this, this presentation very fast. Here we go. Okay, what I'm gonna to do today is um, a brief overview of what Compass is all about. I'm going to deal with, uh, let's see if this is working. Yeah, I'm just gonna deal with uh, several major goals for the session, very basic. I'm gonna review the purposes of Compass, so, you, so those of you who are new to the Compass uh, will have a sense of what it should be used for. Secondly, I'm gonna go into the basic logic of Compass so that hopefully by the end of this session, you've got a really good grasp of the fundamental logic of this thing. And the, the basic, the logic is very clear, very easy. So, um, how risk is determined, what criminogenic needs impact the offender's risk. That's a big role of COMPASS, to actually get at the most relevant factors. Can't stress that enough. Uh, and then I'm going to go into the validation a little bit, how it was validated, how, why should you trust it, what evidence is there, what hard evidence is there that you might trust this thing. And uh, I'm going to look briefly at racial parity, showing that Compass uh, predicts and explains in ways that are very, very, very similar between blacks and whites, particularly. And I'll show you some of the research evidence that is coming up on that topic. Okay, normally I like to do Q&A, by the way, but this time it's, <laughs> I've just got to go. So, so um, uh, anyway, <laughs> I'm slightly thrown by the absence of a Q&A because I like the Q&A. 
Okay, uh, purposes and uses. The first thing from a judicial perspective is that this does not at all reduce the importance of your discretion, your intuition, and how you put the case together in your own way. It shouldn't impact that at all. What it does is it provides relevant information. Okay, then the second one, well, that's the second one, it does provide a much more accurate information, particularly in risk assessment. We know, for example, that the, the modern techniques of risk assessment are gradually getting better and better, and human judgment is uh, somewhere lagging now as the methods become better and as we learn about what are the most predictive factors. And there's a lot of research on that right now. Um, the next big purpose is to inform the staff. They have to come up with case plans. They have to come up with a way to understand this offender. And before you can really treat an offender or, or make judgments about the offender, you need to understand the offender. So Compass has a big role in helping the staff understand what is going on with a particular offender. And that's called targeting. We know what, what particular offense, of offenders to target, what levels of risk to emphasize, and what specific factors should be focused on for case planning and, and treatment and rehabilitation. Um, and then four, um, I mentioned this a lot, something called case formulation. But if you look at nearly all the human, the human discipline professions, you know, from psychiatry to uh, nursing, uh, one, a major step before making your decisions is something called case formulation. The psychiatrist might call it case, now the, the doctors call it case diagnosis, psychiatrists, you know, um, um, they often use the term case formulation. This is how you put the thing in your head and you make sense of the case and that leads to the most important decisions that you may make. So Compass is very much involved in that step number four. And that has a lot to do with connecting the dots. And when you've got a lot of information about a case, one of the most important things you, and with the cognitive activities of the human brain, is to somehow make the right sets of connections and connect the dots in a way that is both justifiable and thoroughly explanatory, if that makes any sense. Now, away from the main purposes now, I'm going to go over through quite quickly the major steps in designing. How did Compass come about? You know, what, what were the major decisions to be made? We see step number one there is what factors should go into it. And many people will say to you, you using Compass, you know, what are the most important factors? Why were those factors collected and assessed? Why not other factors? And there's a lot of science involved in this. I'll get into that science a little, a little bit. Step number two is once you've got your factors, how do you combine them into a decision? And that's another aspect of the human brain because our human brains are fantastically good at pattern recognition and they quickly connect the dots for us. Now that's one style and that's called intuition. And intuition is fast, it's often completely natural to do it, our brain has been evolving for hundreds and hundreds of thousands of years to quickly connect the dots. You know, is it a saber-toothed tiger or my dog? <laughs> and so the human brain has evolved this enormously accurate pattern recognition procedures that we're still trying to understand. Um, so that's step number one there. What are the factors? Step number two is how do we combine these things into making a decision? We'll go over that shortly. And then step number three is how is it validated? I'll show you some of the evidence and validation. And step number four is how can Compass be used by court decision makers? And I'll spend a bit of time on that. I'm particularly interested in the balance between intuition and analytical thinking because those two themes are part of nearly any decision about complex things like, like human beings. Moving on quickly, okay, first step then is what are the factors that were chosen for the compass and why? The graph you're looking at there shows you what sometimes called the big four or the big five, and uh, they consist of, and there's no surprises here because this is gonna fit into common sense. Clearly the first one is uh, criminal history. 
And that drives most of the risk assessments all over the world, all over the nation. They're using certain facets of the criminal history. The most important one, as you probably all know, is number of priors. If someone's got one prior or zero priors or 10 priors, that's got a very strong predictive meaning. And if you put that one factor, the frequency or the number of priors, you can get a pretty good guesstimate of what is the likelihood of that person recidivating. Um, but there's other things about criminal history. As you all know, another big factor coming directly out of criminal history would be something like age at first arrest. And I'll show you the age crime graph shortly. But age at first arrest is a very powerful factor. It turns out that very early arrests are quite predictive of longer and more chronic cr criminal lifestyles. So an arrest at 10 or 9 or 11 is very different from a first arrest at 22 or 35. So the age of the arrest is very, very important. And it, add, it adds another predictive factor. If you think of your best decision as flipping a coin, if you've got a yes, no decision to make, and if all else is equal, 50-50. I mean, 50-50 would do it. So that as a baseline, how much beyond 50% 50 50 accurate can you get? And the more of these factors you add, to the risk assessment, you get little increments of, uh, of uh, more accuracy. Now, the second one is uh, no surprise. Grandma knew about that. Birds of a feather flock together. And if a guy is running around with a lot of people using drugs and crime and in and out of jail, and that's who he hangs with, then that factor alone has got additional predictive validity. Third one is also very important antisocial personality. Now, personality is complex, and there's various aspects of personality. Um, so I can't spend a lot of time on that, but within personality, the most important factor is impulsivity. Another very important one is a sense of entitlement. You know, I'm entitled. I'm the kind of guy that deserves everything. A third is grandiose personality, etc. cetera. So there's about five or six or seven major personality dimensions that we call the criminal personality. And the more of these a person has, and the more extreme the scores, you end up with something called a psychopath. And so psychopathy is a dimension from guys at the very top end of it, as you know, as there's a lot of research on this issue. So personality, big one. Here's another very important one, which is antisocial attitudes. And again, the human mind can create justifications for what you've done. I didn't rape her, she, she, she seduced me, or, or I didn't rob that house, they, they were rich and they stole it from me anyway. So there's a variety of rationalizations that offenders can make that factors into, are they going to do it again? Um, so again, there's a few things, I don't have time to go into this in detail. And then there's a very important one called antisocial opportunity or high-risk lifestyle. Now, you all probably know the concept of living in the fast lane or living on the wild side or whatever it is to me, but some offenders are just very, very, um, what's the best word? Use a very, very uh, um, high-risk lifestyle, out every night, getting drunk every night, hanging with the boys every night, doing a lot of kind of crazy things, often out of boredom. And that leads to more opportunities. That single variable, if you can get a handle on the person's lifestyle, then you've got a good understanding of what is it that's driving that person towards crime. Moving on a little bit, whoops. Um, age crime, I don't have much time now to spend on this, but this graph occurs all over the world. Africa, Australia, New Zealand, Britain, America, here in uh, Michigan, where I lived on South Carolina. It's the same graph, it's a fascinating graph. When does crime peak? Now, this, this side here is age. Age 10, 20, 30, blah, blah, blah. And this is frequency of crimes. Now, what you see is that under 10, there's some, but very, very few. And during the teenage years, very rapid increase in the frequency of crime. And then it peaks around here. 
And then after that peak, there's a very, very rapid, what we call desistance, or the ending of the criminal career. Now, you all know about these examples. I mean, the guy, he's a hellraiser at 18, and he's a family man at 26. So that kind of, dis that kind of uh, transition is what's going on here. So crime actually peaks, typically, in the late uh, teenage years, 17, 18, now this is for girls, and what you see is that you much the same graph, but uh, it's much lower, but it does have the same peak. Girls often seem to start a little earlier. They peak around here, which is a year, a couple of years younger than the boys do, and then again a rapid decline. So around here you've got uh, the evidence of a huge amount of uh, growing out of crime. He gets into college, he gets a family, he gets a wife, and all these things take a person away from the street and away from that uh, wilder side. Uh, these are lists of all these explanatory factors that are in the compass of various kinds of compass. Here you've got uh, the male compass with all the big eight and the big five, all the research done on that to support the validity of these factors. They're all highly valid. And that distinguishes them from clutter. Factors that you might think are relevant, but they're really, re really not relevant. They don't have such a high predictive or explanatory value. And then there's a separate list for women, including things like experience of sexual and physical abuse as a, as a child, big impact on a lot of women, relationship dysfunctions, and so forth. Lots of very important things in the assessment and treatment of women. That work was done a lot by um, Professor Van Voorhees at Cincinnati, and uh, it continues to this day in terms of being very valid. And then Youth Compass, uh, the reason why Youth Compass is long is because we go to the family in much more detail, the school, the, um, the post-school environment, et cetera, et cetera. So youth has got a different focus on different factors. Moving on. Um, I mentioned connecting the dots and understanding the offender. That has to do with like, how do you put these factors together when you've got all these different factors? What is it that you're looking for? Well, there's six simple pathways. And each of these pathways is a dominant pathway, a well-trodden pathway, if you like. So each of these pathways is, lead is what leads persons into crime. Let me explain very quickly what they are. Uh, the first one is called strain theory. And many of you know that, you might, social exclusion, social marginalization, excluded from economic society, oftentimes excluded in a variety of ways. So strain is the reaction toward being marginalized by the society. And many of the offenders that I've looked at and many of the offenders in our databases have got huge scores on no job, no education, no money, no stable place to live. And there's, there's a definite signature, and here's the compass signature. Jobless astray, low education, um, uh, housing problems, poverty. If we could go on, there's about seven or eight factors in compass that nail the strain and marginalization, social exclusion as a pathway to crime. The second one is called social learning theory. It's got a slightly different pattern. Social learning theory is built on a simple premise that we learn from our community, we learn from our friends, we learn from our peer group, we learn from our family. So if I've got a high crime family, high crime peer group, I'm living in a high crime area, I've, and, then I, and then the score in criminal thinking is one of the big connecting of the dots thing there. If the person has all those things plus uh, antisocial attitudes, Sometimes that's called almost a socio-cultural theory of crime. And there's some great books on this particular. There's a book called Code of the Street um, by a guy called Elijah Anderson, black professor at Harvard, goes into social learning theory and just nails that theory. And so when you look at that compass data, you can get a sense of these explanations of crime and how to connect the dot. Social control theory is the same as social bonding. And the more bonds you have, a bonds to my church, Bonds to my Uncle Joe, he's a great guy and I love him. Bonds to my family, I respect my family. 
Christian bonds and so forth, belief values, bonds take away, take people away from um, the, the bad life, the dark side. And um, that's a whole theory, and it's very well validated theory as well. And I'm not going to spend much more time on this, but routine activity, very quickly, that's the theory of high risk lifestyle, running around crazy looking for action. And uh, there's some signature patterns there in Compass. And then there's a straight personality. This is the, the psychopathic kind of deal where the main themes are impulsivity, narcissistic aggression, callous, etc. Early onset, another non early onset's a very good indicator of psychopathy. And then situational induced stress is very well known. You often find guys in jail who have never done anything before, but they've attacked their brother-in-law or they've attacked their wife or something. And we call these situationally induced crime. And it's often surprising that someone with a, rape, with a sexual charge or, a, or an assault and battery charge who's never done anything before in their life ends up in that kind of explanation. Going postal would be another kind of example that we all know about, where the stress level, the cumulative stresses, finally get to the person. Um, how are factors combined? This is a, another big step. Well, you can see s four ways there. The first way, which is the most common way, is you connect, you connect them in your own heads. You read about the case, you learn about the case, you got the criminal history, etc., etc., and you integrate this or synthesize it with your own brain. Now that gradually grows over time. As you do case after case after case after case, after a while on the bench, you, you can almost say, I've seen it all. You know, and when you get to that point where you've learned from successive cases, you just build up this beautiful, what's the best word? Um, you build up an enormous, resource of information that you can call on as you see the new case and where does it fit with my and that's these are intuitive decisions because you often do this automatically almost um, subconsciously you're doing this and that's why it's very fast and oftentimes very accurate but sometimes it can go wrong for people think they see a pattern and they, they lock onto the wrong pattern Stereotyping is an example of that, where the intuitive decision process goes wrong. Um, the second one is interesting. We now move into the analytical side of things and just add up the risk factors. If there's 10 risk factors, one, two, three, four, five, and um, yeah, did you say 10 minutes? Okay, 10 minutes. Um, a very simple thing is called additive scoring. 10 risk factors. Add the, how many risk factors a guy got, he's got nine, he's a very high risk. He's got two, and then you chop it off, one through four risk factors, he's relatively low, five to seven or something, he's kind of medium, and eight and above, he's definitely on the, on the, on the hard side. Now that particular simple method is very, very robust. In fact, there's a beautiful uh, statistical analysis called the robust beauty of additive linear models. Now, by robust beauty, what they meant by that is that this particular method has got very good generalizability. You can do it in New York, you can do it in San Francisco, you can do it in Detroit here or whatever, and it gives you good predictive, it became a baseline, and it was the basis for all parole decision from during the 1920s, this went first emerged, and it's still being used, the simple additive linear model. Number three is interesting. We've moved into fancy statistical methods, mostly, um, mostly linear regression methods. I'll show you some of the results of these. Survival analysis, another one that comes from medical research. You know, the guy comes in with cancer, or the, all these people have got cancer. You get the first date that they, they arrived, and how long do they take to survive? When is the... When do they f fall off the, the consciousness? Um, and then in the last eight years, there's a whole new set of what we call artificial intelligence methods. They're, they're not much yet in criminal justice, but they're on the verges. The, the cops are using them for identifying hotspots. What's the pattern for hotspots and where can we predict the next crime, et cetera, et cetera. We've been using them in, inside jails 
to try to plot who's the most likely disciplinary problems and so forth. So these methods are all available, but this remains the traditional one and the most widespread still in criminal justice. And I think there's a beautiful quote from Judge, uh, what's his name, Earl? <coughs> Famous Supreme Court judge, we'll get to him shortly. So that's a set of the ways in which factors are collected. And in the, in the method here in, um, in uh, Michigan, uh, we're using both second generation and third generation methods to do the predictive modeling. But that is only to be present at the table. It should not drive your decision. You should only have it as a, as a um, if it can help and if it makes sense, you might take it into consideration. But it does not make the decision, and your intuition or your discretion remains above all, all, all this stuff. Okay? Um, how to evaluate the validity? Okay, let's get into it. The, the key number in this chart is uh, this thing called, at the top of MDN, you see a bunch of numbers there. Those represent what's called AUC coefficients. And they're the standard way in which scientists measure predictive accuracy. And anything from 6 to 5, 0.65 and higher is a good measure. 0.7, no, you're doing great. And you can see that uh, this is the compass here, the LSI. at 64, LSI short version. They lose a lot of predictive validation. Um, and so forth and others. There's two outliers here. And you notice there's only one, there's only one uh, study done for these two. And you see that the very high accuracy levels, and that's because the predictive test was done in the same sample that was used to develop the test. And whenever people do that, it's a no-no, because you get what's called shrinkage when it's used on a different sample. So it's very important always to test your, your predictive methods on different sounds. You've done that about five or six times. Michigan, more than anybody, has done a whole lot of predictive validation tests. Uh, moving on, um, this looks at, um, uh, let's see, this is, um, a set of different re testing the compass in different places. Now, the first two studies up here were done in New York, New York probation. And the, oh, these are the, the predictive accuracies for any arrest, felony arrest, person arrest, non-compliance, return to prison. Each of them can be attempted to predict those numbers. And you can see that they're all in the 70s and high 60s. Here's Michigan with uh, re-entry and probation and getting nice um, AUC numbers that are very, could instill confidence that this is a really good, accurate test. Moving on, another, this is a survival analysis now. We split your sample, oh, this is Michigan data, into three levels, low, medium, and high. Um, here's uh, what happens, this is time. This is the point at which they got out. And this is felony failure probabilities. Now what you see here is that the lowest group there's a lower trajectory on reoffending, and it doesn't, it's not a very steep curve. So it's a, a low trajectory. When you look at the medium and the high group, and these are confidence intervals that statisticians use to say, well, how confident can I be in this data, uh, showing you that you've got very nice separation, and uh, that's, your, that's your higher failure rate for the high group and reach higher levels. And it steadies off after you get you know, more, than, more than a few years out. So different kinds of validity. Um, now wrapping up the, uh, I'll move quickly to the, to the race issue. Uh, here's um, white and black samples. Whoops, where am I? Yeah, white and black samples. Uh, and here's the magic number, the AUCs. Now what you see here is whites, 69, black, 70. The total sample of all the prisoners, 
71. So these numbers are very, very similar to each other, showing that the accuracy level to predict for blacks is the same or very, very similar to the accuracy level for whites. Now that's one kind of test, and we've done the same for uh, general recidivism and, uh, oops, and for um, violent recidivism with much the same results. And you see the result here, white and black and the average. So these numbers, again, are sufficiently, and here's the confidence intervals, and you see that these, these results are all within the confidence intervals, which means you can't say that one is any better than the other. They're fundamentally equal. Uh, and here's a very important slide. This one says, here is um, the risk score in Compass. And the risk score is split f to 10 levels, you know, one, two, three, four, five, five. And what this axis here is the actual probability of going out and recidivating. There's black, white defendant and black defendant. And what you see here is, a, is two lines f basically quite parallel and rather close to each other, and again within the, the range of, uh, of uh, confidence li limit. And what this tells you is that a low score for, for blacks, a low score for whites, means the same kind of outcomes. In other words, if you go eight and above, you're going to be up to here at the 70%, 80% recidivating. So this group that gets scores up here, very, very high risk of recidivating. Again, it's just another validation test. It does two things. It shows you that you got a very steep curve saying that you can actually see a, a gradually increasing rate of failure at the high risk levels. And the, the fact that these are close to each other and essentially in the same direction means that if these lines were diver diverging in some way, then you could say racism. But the fact that these lines are sufficiently aligned with each other is a good proof of parity between the two races for Compass. Moving on, I'm going to give finally this beautiful statement that I've been talking about. Here's Oliver Wendell Holmes, well-known um, Supreme Court judge. And here's the statement. It's the merit of the common law. That it decides the case first, and then determines the principles afterward. Now, that statement here, he also did some weird other thing. It contrasts reaching the decision first with your own judgment, your own intuition, in your own head, p pulling all the dots together and making your decision with all of your uh, experiences and so forth. And uh, following that up, only then does the analytical stuff come in. Does that make sense? He apparently would uh, give the other judges uh, Here's a legal principle and apply it to a case. And then they would take a different legal principle and apply it to a case. And he could actually make the case work out either way, you know, by the way in which he works through rational analytical procedures to justify just about anything. So he had a good respect for, um, for intuition. Oops. So just to wrap it up, this final thing is quite important. How can Compass help? Keeping in mind what the Supreme Court judge there just said, intuition on the one hand and analytical rationality on the other, and you need both. So um, there's a number of features of, of uh, rationality. It's harder, it's slower, you've really got to get the right kind of data. And, um, and generally, you needed to understand the case. But that feel for the case comes from a different source. It comes from intuition, deep, cumulative experience of cases, know-how rather than know that. Know-how becomes the actual skill. Knowing that, you might be able to talk about the skill. And uh, finally, when you get, once you understand these two things, and these two are deep aspects of the human brain, you get to something called common sense. And the current cognitive research on common sense is saying common sense is the judicial use of both intuition 
and ration, rational analytic stuff. So Compass does both. As you learn more and more and more about understanding these cases, you build up, you build up this uh, analytical rationality, but you also build up the intuition. Chess masters are like this. They can look at a board and boom, they, they can see immediately. And that represents the cumulative, what's the best word, synthesis of both very good intuition and very good analytical rationality. Judges are much the same, I think. There's a lot of developments in, um, in what we call novice to expert development in very different professions. And these differences from novice to expert have a lot to say about the, the, the gradual buildup of both of these two things culminating in common sense and sometimes culminating in wisdom. Wisdom actually these days is seen as the judicious use of the right method for the right kind of case. Yeah? <laughs> I'm done. <laughs> Thank you all. Thank you, Dr. Brennan. Sure. Uh, next, we have Laura, Laura Newman. Uh, Laura Newman is currently a field supervisor for the Michigan Department of Corrections in the Kalamazoo Probation Parole Office, where she has been since 1997. She received her bachelor's in criminal justice from Bowling Green State University, go Falcons. And in 1994, her master's in criminal justice from Northeastern University in 1995. I didn't have time to look up what their mascot was. Prior to the department, she was a district court probation officer for the 8th District Court in Kalamazoo. Funny, your bio doesn't mention that you were once a guest on the two-time award-winning podcast that I co-host uh, for the MDOC. I guess that was an oversight. Anyway, please help me welcome Laura to the stage. I appear to have lost my clicker, so... <laughs> Thank you. All right. Let's... Well, I might need a little technical. There we go. There we go, sorry about that for the technical difficulties. So um, good morning to all of you. Um, I'm sure you all have this main question is why, why, why? So I get that all the time. Why do we need to change the report? Why are you limiting my discretion? Um, why are you adding time to the agent's um, duties that they have? So I wanna talk about the first thing is, um, with the why is discretion. And we're really not taking away discretion from any of the stakeholders in the pre-sentence process. What we're actually doing is giving you more tools in your toolbox to use when making those sentencing decisions or recommendations. When we talk about agents and them worrying about the time that it takes, um, the extra time at the pre-sentence stage, I would say to you that there is a learning curve and just as Dr. Brennan talked, as they learn things more and have that intuition, the process gets easier. But I would also say that it helps um, in the pre-sentence report, having it in there for the case planning process. And we've been doing case planning for a long time, and this gives us a better roadmap. I think, though, that the more important question of all of this is why not? And the reason why I say why not is we've been doing the same thing for over 20 years since I've been at the department. And why would we think that a pre-sentence report should not change, should not get better, we should not have more information at that stage when we are making critical decisions about offenders? So I'd like to start out my presentation by talking about Mary. 
And so I always say there's something about Mary. And I met Mary back in 2010 when I was a gender-specific probation agent. We had talked a lot about gender-specific supervision at that time, the needs of female offenders, and making sure we were needing those, meeting those needs. So when I met Mary, uh, she had run up her parents' credit cards to about $4,000. Um, she came into my office and she was from an upper middle class, or I would say upper middle class home at least. Um, in my opinion, and probably everybody else, Mary was a spoiled brat. You know, that person who, you know, you meet and you're just like, this is going to be a doozy. And through that pre-sentence process, this is what I found out about Mary. Mary was emotionally neglected at home. At times, I would say it would border on some physical abuse. Her parents fought all the time. Her dad was unfaithful to her mom. She um, was exposed to this. She was the scapegoat for every person in her family. And this all led to Mary acting out. She was impulsive. Stealing was a way to try to get attention. Um, and there was many things that, through my gender-specific training, that I was able to see about Mary and what needs needed to be met. Um, it would have been nice to have a compass assessment, though, at that time to validate my hunches. So what I found was that Mary at one time had a great peer group, but she started losing her friends. And then she started hanging out with some really bad friends. And then she had this boyfriend who I didn't realize at the beginning, but maybe with a female compass I would have, he was very emotionally abusive towards her. And Mary started failing school. She was a good student and started failing at everything. And so I looked at what was my case plan going to be for Mary. And with that gender-specific training, what I knew was important is that I needed to have Mary connected at different places. She wasn't finding the connection at her family, and so she needed to be connected at different places. So she was skipping school, and I made a requirement for her to go to school. I checked in with her guidance counselor all the time and made sure that she was attending. And then counseling became really important. Mary needed to see that she needed to work on her own issues independent of her family and that she had some power. And she had a great counselor who really believed in her. And then I also gave Mary a curfew. Um, I think we all know that nothing good happens after midnight. And for Mary, that was the case because she liked to sneak out of the house. And then I like to talk about what Mary wanted to do. Mary had great goals. She wanted to get straight A's that first semester she was under supervision, and she ended up with a 3.5. And that boyfriend that Mary had that was so great, once we realized he wasn't so great, we got rid of him, and we had a no contact order. And then the other thing that I knew was important is Mary needed to get a job. Even though she was a high school student, she was in her senior year, she needed to pay back restitution, and she didn't really have those bonds at home or pro-social people to look up to, and so we looked at having her get a job, and she did that. And the thing that I like to talk about Mary's story is I ran into her a couple years ago before this um, Compass PSI um, started and I ran into her at a restaurant and she she came up to me and she's like Lara you changed my life you do not know what you did for me and she said I'm about to graduate from college and I was like that's awesome that's great she goes you don't even know part of it she goes I've worked here this whole time and I have paid my way through college I did not have to rely on my parents you helped to give me those tools that I knew I didn't have to rely on them anymore and I'm about to graduate, and I did it all on my own. And that's why we meet offenders' needs. We meet their needs so we can give them the tools so that they can succeed on their own. And they are not going backwards and looking at recidivating and those types of things. So I'm sure for a lot of you that you're all wondering what this new pre-sentence report looks like. And so what you're going to see new in the pre-sentence report is you're going to see a needs assessment grid that I'll show you later. And this is going to be based on the type of compass assessment that they have. You're also going to see added information in the um, evaluation and plan of the pre-sentence report in what should be a positive or negative section or strengths and weaknesses. Um, that might sound familiar to you. 
And then on the re recommendation page, which is the CFJ 145, you're gonna see special conditions that should correspond to each offender's compass needs. So in the evaluation and plan, you should see strengths and weaknesses. And I know that for a lot of you, you probably see the only positive is they appeared for the PSI interview. And so we wanna change that. And so for Mary, what it would say is, positives for the defendant include appearing for the pre-sentence investigation. The defendant has lived at the same residence for her entire life and in an area that is free from crime and gangs. Mary does not rationalize her involvement in the instant offense and does show some remorse for her actions. She does not place herself in high crime, high opportunity situations. She does not show any indication of a substance abuse problem and denies any use of alcohol or drugs. And then what you would see for negatives, which would be those needs that are listed as probable or highly probable in the grid, is something like this. Unfortunately, the defendant does have many negative aspects to her life. Mary has experienced abuse as a child and an adult. She has been neglected by her parents for much of her teenage years. Her father has been arrested in the past for domestic violence against her mother. Mary does not have a good relationship with her parents, siblings, or boyfriend, which has led to problems with school. She often isolates herself and reports feeling lonely most of the time. Currently, Mary is a senior in high school and is failing many of her classes. She was fired from the only job she has ever held as a result of this offense. So when I talk about the needs grid you will see, um, is this is what it will look like. It'll have the compass needs scale, and this is the female version, the scale score, and then a recommendation. And as you can see, like the unlikelies have none, but all the probables and highly probables have some sort of recommendation on it. So for Mary, criminal associates appears. Um, we looked at limiting contact and having a curfew. Um, for her leisure and recreation, we looked at encouraging pro-social activities. This is what um, a grid would look like for prison. And as you can see, it's gonna say, will be assessed upon incarceration for the supervision recommendation. And the reason we do that is because the prisons do use um, compass um, need scales, but they have their own uh, grids in the way that they use that when the offender comes into the institution. So we just put will be assessed in, upon incarceration because it doesn't make sense to say how we'll supervise them as they won't be in the community at first. And then if somebody has a recommendation for fines and costs or jail only, we're gonna put no supervision as recommended. When you look at the CFJ 145, which is the recommendation page, that's where you're gonna see the jail credit. And then usually um, in Kalamazoo, we do fines and costs. But then you're gonna see recommendations that should relate to the offender's needs. In this case, Mary needed vocational, um, and we put educational or GED programming. You are not gonna see what's highlighted in yellow, just so you know. And um, this talks about the curfew, which addresses uh, criminal associates and peers. I will tell you that not every, con not every need always needs a condition. Sometimes you're gonna see in there that the agent is gonna monitor that behavior. We don't want to over-supervise offenders because our evidence-based research has shown not to do that. Um, but we are looking that the conditions will meet so that case planning can be seamless. So many of you have either received a manual or have been able to view it online. For our agents who are completing the pre-sentence reports, they kind of call it their compass Bible on putting the um, compass results in the pre-sentence report. And what this has in it um, is all the compass needs. It will give you the scale on how it's measured, notes and treatment implications, and then also special conditions that you can use to meet those needs. So in this case, we have leisure and recreation. Um, and it looks at some of the special conditions, participate in GED, complete CBT program, um, sometimes it can be electronic monitoring to limit their movements, finding employment, community service, those are some ways to meet it. I know that there's a lot of questions from people about what COMPASS doesn't measure. 
And so to make sure that we had something uh, uh, in other category, we did realize that there are certain categories that the compass does not measure. And one of those examples would be mental health. Sometimes we think about sex offending. And so the agents can put information um, based on that intuition and professional judgment in other categories. So in this example, we have mental health, and that's based on the pre-sentence investigator's interview. And um, we look at the treatment implications. Those people with severe and persistent mental health disorders need more intensive interventions, and then it looks at some of the special conditions. So taking medication, psychological evaluations, mental health treatment. I wanna um, basically in closing talk to all of you just a little bit about what I hope that you get out of this new pre-sentence report. What I hope that you realize is that the compass is just one more tool in your toolbox for prosecutors, judges, defense attorneys, agents. It's one more tool to help you do your job on a daily basis. We make really important decisions that affect people's lives every day. And we hope that you will use this information to make good decisions for each offenders. Thank you. Thank you, Laura. And now on to our final presenter. Next we have the Honorable Kathleen M. Brickley. Judge Kathleen Brickley is currently the Chief Judge of Van Buren County Courts, first appointed to the bench in 2012. Judge Brickley has served as the Chief Judge since 2015. She is Chairperson of the Van Buren County uh, Community Corrections Advisory Board and presides over the Female Drug Treatment Family Treatment Court Program and the Swift and Sure Sanctions Probation Program. A uh, 1988 graduate of Notre Dame Law School, go Irish, although I wouldn't say that too much this week, uh, at, least, at least in this town. Um, Judge uh, Brickley uh, was an associate at Warner, Norcross, and Judd from 1988 to 1990, followed by private practice from 1990 to 2012. She is a member of several associations, including Drug Treatment Court Policy Council, Substance Abuse Task Force, and the Michigan Judicial Institute Academic Advisory Committee. She is also co-chair of the Michigan Judges Association Criminal Committee. So please help me welcome Judge Brickley. Good morning, everyone. I want to start with an apology to the audience that I did not prepare my own PowerPoint. Mike Keck, whose name I'm not supposed to mention, helped prepare that document, and I want to apologize to Mike Peck, or Mike Heck for the fact that I, I don't usually follow PowerPoints very well, so those are my apologies. But we, in Van Buren, we've been doing the Compass um, since last fall. And I, like Laura brought up, had the same concerns originally of, you know, why add this to this sentencing process, which is already laborious in nature. We wait weeks, sometimes months, to get a pre-sentence report. The agents are swamped investigating the antecedents, character, and circumstances of these defendants. And um, on the day of the sentencing, you know, judges have 10 or 20 sentencings to do. The lawyers are crazy. They've got other places to be. So isn't this just going to, to add to this already somewhat uh, problematic process, uh, depending on the sentencing day? Um, but. I would suggest that all of us in the criminal justice system have a duty to use evidence-based uh, processes and programs when available uh, to target our attentions, to our attention to individualize the needs of the offender, um, especially when those have been shown to reduce recidivism. Um, but because Mr. Keck came up with a better quote, um, I'll tell you what uh, Judge Warren, who's past president of National Center for State Courts, uh, says about it, which is today we need smarter and more individualized sentencing and corrections policies that allow judges, prosecutors, corrections officers, and other practitioners to more carefully target those individual offenders who should be imprisoned and those who are the most appropriate candidates for effective treatment 
intermediate sanctions or community corrections programs. Um, what I found to be some of the benefits of the Compass information as a judge in my pre-sentence report uh, are many. Uh, one is that the information provides a more in-depth look at the factors driving the offender's criminal behavior. Um, as noted, the reports have a lot of information in them about the antecedents, character, and circumstances of the offender and the offense. But my reports, I've, I've found, are more consistent now, and, the, and there's a focus and a highlight on, on the criminogenic needs as opposed to other factors. Uh, and there's consistency from report to report, from author to author, uh, that helps me uh, feel that I'm imposing sentences that are more fair and equal, although individualized to the offender. Um, also, the recommendations are more focused on the individual offender as opposed to the specific offense. Uh, gone are the days of the generic one-size-fits-all probation orders, where, oh, it's a drug offense, recommend treatment. Um, it's it's an embezzlement offense, the guy's got to get to work right away. Well. Oftentimes, drug offenders, when you do a compass, you realize they don't need treatment, um, but they may need a curfew. They may need uh, tether monitoring if their issues are antisocial peer associations. Um, if you have, like I say, the embezzler, um, you can tell them to get a job right away, but if they have the antisocial behavior thinking problems that cause them to act out, instantly and emotionally whenever something happens in their life they don't like and they're going to explode on their boss at work, that might be an offender that you need to focus on cognitive behavioral therapy before you bother putting them in the workplace. And these are all recommendations that now come into my pre-sentence reports that are based on the offender, not just generically on the offense. Uh, there's a clear connection in what I've found between the recommended conditions and the needs that they address. Previously, I know other judges in the room probably have seen this and attorneys as well, where you can't figure out why is this person getting a recommendation for community service work? Why does this person have a recommendation for GPS tether? Um, why, you can't, couldn't make sense of it. Why this guy and not this guy? Um, well, now you could go back to the grid that Laura talked about, and you can go back to the few sentences that are in your report, and it just makes sense. Oh, I get why this guy's got a curfew. He's hanging out with bad people. This person's got a bad family life. They're pushing this person to get out of the home more and do more pro productive activities and pro-social activities. Um, we had a woman in, Cal in uh, Van Buren County who, it was a felonious assault case, and there was a recommendation for community service work. And it, well, okay, I didn't really understand at the time, but um, that recommendation was made because she was uh, socially isolated and the investigator wanted her out. Well, they got her out and uh, sure enough, this woman came back later. She got all of her community service work done in two weeks and wanted to do more. Well, what was uncovered was that she was living in a, in a very controlling environment with her husband. She wasn't allowed to go out unless ordered by the court. Uh, so that then led to a lot of other factors being explored in this woman's life. And sure enough, she's now got a quilting club and has left him and her life is much better. But those are things that would not have been uncovered had the compass not been in the report to identify that she was socially isolated and needed to do community service work to get herself out, out and about more. Um, also, my pre-sentence reports, the recommendations I found target the needs that will have the greatest impact on re reducing recidivism. Um, again, there's a lot of things in these pre-sentence report, and we have to, we have only so many resources. So I'm finding that the, the recommendations, I can hone in on, on what this person clearly needs that's most likely to reduce recidivism. Some of them have self-esteem issues, some of them have health problems, and those are certainly matters worth noting in the report, but those aren't the highest, most impactful factors. So the reports now are, are honing in more on the, the factors that are most impactful on whether or not this person's going to reoffend. Uh, cautions and concerns related to the use of compass at sentencing. Um, caution for judges in particular. Um, the compass is not designed to determine 
whether or not you're going to put someone in prison or whether or not you're going to put them on probation. It's not designed to determine the length of a sentence. Uh, Compass is designed, and, and, that's how, and if you use it in this fashion, uh, you'll find that it's very helpful. It's designed to help you determine the conditions of probation. What does this person need to succeed, not only on probation, but in life, so that they don't come back? How are we going to allocate our limited resources? Um, high need offenders. Um, an offender with multiple high needs does not always equate to high risk. So don't infer based on the offender's needs. When you first start getting used to these charts, you're going to see, you may see highly probable, highly probable, highly probable, highly probable, and think, oh, okay, this person has so many high, highly probable needs, I better get them off the street. And that's not necessarily what it's saying. A person could have one probable need and be more at risk to reoffend than someone who's just basically a hot mess, if you will. They just have a lot of needs and we need to dedicate a lot of resources to them to help them succeed in life. So that's a caution in particular to judges when you're reviewing those grids. Don't think, oh, this person, I'm going to put this person away because of this. Uh, concerns that we had initially that have not played out so much, but there were concerns that it would delay the pre-sentence reports and that my sentencings, which are already backlogged, um, would be even farther out, and that has not happened. I know the Department of Corrections in my county had some concerns about whether it would take them longer, uh, but my department was already doing Compass a lot of times for the Swift and Sure eligibility anyway, um, so none of that has played out, and, and all's fine as far as sentencing any delays that hasn't happened. Um, there were concerns that there would be a lot of arguments or objections over the information in the report. Personally, I've had none, zero, in almost a year. And I found, to the contrary, that both sides actually use it to bolster their, their cause. So uh, a defendant who maybe doesn't want his client on probation may say, look at this person showing no needs. And, you know, why bother? Why not just give him fines and costs? Or um, or, or if there's a lot of needs, well, this person shouldn't be sitting in jail. We need to take care of this person. There's a lot of needs here. We need to get at it right away. Um, and same with the prosecutors. It gives them, it bolsters their cause for whatever agreement that they've reached. And I think for the defendants, maybe, maybe I'm just trying to see inside their brain, but there's a perception of fairness now. When they read that recommendation page and see, oh, man, they're recommending four months tether. I don't want four months tether. At least they can see in the report why that makes sense, and their lawyer can explain to them, this recommendation is here because you have some bad associates. We need to monitor where you're going or for whatever other reason that's in there. Um, so for us, that, that concern has not played out. Um, cases that involve the, the risk assessment scores, we haven't had any in Michigan yet. There is an argument on a motion for resentence being made in Berrien County at this time, it's my understanding. Um, Malinchik, um, Indiana, that's, that case is a big one from Indiana, and if, for judges who are just starting, you may want to, and, and practitioners as well, it doesn't hurt to at least review these cases. Malinchuk talks a lot about the science of, of these compass tests, and the issue there was whether or not the lower court erroneously considered that risk assessment score as an aggravating circumstance when imposing the sentence. Uh, defense argued that it was improper, obviously, and the court held that legitimate offender assessment instruments do not replace, but may inform a trial court's sentencing determination. And all of these cases basically are saying the same thing, that it is not a replacement for using your judgment as a judge. And, and you're still to consider rehabilitation and punishment and deterrence and protection. It's an adjunct. It, it supplements. It doesn't supplant uh, what, what we normally do. Um, and again, this is the holding of that case, which says in many more words what I just said. And then we have State uh, v. SAMHSA, and that was the Court of Appeals from Wisconsin. And again, fairly the same issue. Uh, but whether the lower court erroneously considered the Compass need scores as an aggravating circumstance when imposing sentence, um, the court held that Compass is, again, merely one tool available to the court at the time of sentencing and they may rely on some parts while rejecting others. The lower court used their experience in determining that several of offenders' high needs were those in areas that could impact risk. Uh, so 
again, that case kind of talks about it's not an all or nothing proposition. If a court or lawyers want to hone in on some of the needs um, and focus on that and you choose in your discretion as a judge to disregard other parts of it, that's fine. It's another tool that you have for your sentencing. And that's the, the final uh, or order from that court, basically saying that. Uh, State v. Loomis, um, uh, Wisconsin Supreme Court and the United States Supreme Court has just recently declined the opportunity to take that case up. And this is a good one to talk about the cautions of use of the compass. Um, that the issue before the court was whether or not compass could be considered when making the decision. Uh, the court held that if used properly, observing the limitations and cautions, the court's consideration of a compass assessment at sentencing does not violate a defendant's due process. As a judge, you don't want to say in your sentencing decision, I read your compass, you've got a lot of needs, you're going to prison. Thank you, goodbye. Um, that's not how you use compass. Um, and this Loomis talks a lot about that, about the cautions of it and the appropriate use of it. And that's why I would highly recommend that, that others read that case if you have any concerns about it. Again, it's the same theme. It's a tool in your tool, toolbox. And that's the uh, official ruling from the Wisconsin Supreme Court. We conclude if used properly, observing the limitations and cautions, cautions set forth, the circuit court's consideration of the compass risk assessment at sentencing does not violate a defendant's right to due process. Some lessons that we've learned in Van Buren County, uh, again, I've noted that we, we definitely see more consistency in our pre-sentence investigation reports. As judges and uh, practitioners, you probably see, see different flavors and different um, bents, if you will, in your pre-sentence reports, and sometimes you can kind of figure out who the author is after you've read about two paragraphs of it. Well, after you've read the recommendation sometimes, but you get, a, you get a feel for who's who. But at least now there's consistency. They're honing in. It's not about whether they're mad at them um, because they called twice to reschedule the interview or something of that nature, or they, they didn't like the outfit they wore for the interview. It's that you still may have those references, but there's that consistency from report to report to report with the focus being on the criminogenic needs of this person. Um, the results are not changing decisions related to incarceration versus community. I can't say at all that I have made any different decisions of whether to put someone in jail or prison or probation because of Compass, but I can say that I have altered the conditions of my probation. Um, I'm finding I probably impose more community service work now on the uh, offenders that are showing too much leisure time, leisure activity, or if their family environment um, is not good and I feel that they, I want to get them out of the house and maybe the young kid could find a new role model by doing community service work somewhere. Um, so it's definitely, you're, you're picking and choosing those terms and you're not giving them terms that they don't need because I think we all in this room know the dangers of over conditioning these people or under conditioning. So you're targeting your terms of probation is what I found is the biggest difference in my sentencing. <clears throat> For me as well, my conversation with the defendant has changed fairly dramatically at sentencing. I try to look to what I find, what I see are the most highly probable needs for this offender, and that's what I talk about with them, because I want the offender to leave my courtroom knowing that you've got, you just got a probation term with 100 conditions, or however many are on there, and there were three that are really important to me as the judge, and those are the three I'm gonna talk about with you right now. And if any of you are involved in specialty courts, you know that as judges, we should spend three minutes with these offenders. It's hard to do on a typical sentencing docket, but you do wanna spend your time wisely, and if you're going to have a conversation with them, it's best to let them know that you're concerned about those areas that are the criminogenic needs, because I do believe that they listen to us as judges. Um, again, it allows me to focus my resources on those who need it the most. Um, and for us, I've found um, that it fills some of the gaps that we've had in our community. I've, I've found reading these pre-sentence reports that, for example, we had a lot of offenders that are needing cognitive behavioral therapy. So at our Community Corrections Advisory Board, we talk about we need more money for this. So you, you see as you read more and more of these what the needs are in your community and then you get those needs met if you're able to do so. 
Um, so all in all with us, um, the concerns that everybody had, they just haven't come to fruition. It hasn't been a, this dramatic change that we all were worried about. And I think everyone in my county anyway has found it to be very helpful um, to hone in on the needs of our offenders when we're sentencing these people. So thank you very much. Thank you, Your Honor. Uh, we'll have you take a seat and we'll bring back up our previous two presenters and we'll go over some of the questions that we got from the audience uh, here and also from those watching our live feed. Hopefully that you got the mic working. All right. Hello. All right, yes. we're good to go. All right, the first question is for Dr. Brennan. And the question is, how does targeting happen when it comes to risks and needs? Um, targeting is, is a huge issue in what's called the RNR principles, risk, needs, responsivity. They arrived on the scene about 10 years ago, and as far as I can see, they've kind of swept the field. I mean, every conference that I go to, it's the RNR principles, it's validation of the R principle. RNR stands for risk, then needs, and responsivity. And so what, what the rules are there for targeting is that what the first one, the, the need principle, sorry, the risk principle says what, what kind of prisoner or what kind of offender should I give my most intensive treatment to? And so generally higher risks are supposed to be, be given the highest intensity treatment. Conversely, lower, the low risks Apparently, the more treatment you give there, the worse, the worse, it, the worse, it, the worse it turns out. So, in other words, uh, a lot of these people just deserve to be right back into the community and supported, and um, you know, not given serious, um, serious incarceration or punishment. So, that's the first general rule. You get a lot of details if you go to the national conferences. Second rule: the needs principle. Focus in on the criminogenic needs, the ones that have high predictive value high explanatory value, because those factors should be targeted. So that's the second really useful targeting. So anything that's got an eight, nine, or 10, or a highly probable, means that you should probably focus efforts on, on those. Responsivity is tough. Responsivity says, how do you best match a prisoner to a particular pattern of, uh, of, uh, of treatments and interventions. And that requires that thing that I was talking about earlier called case conceptualization. If you get a really good case formulation in your mind and you can, you've connected the dots in the right way, then you've got a much better understanding of that offender and therefore a better chance of lining up the right kind of sequence of interventions. Very good. Thank you very much. Uh, the next question is for, for Laura. What are the most common uh, criminogenic needs that you are seeing in your population? I think that's a, that's probably a hard question. I mean, I think that, um, you know, obviously the big five that Dr. Brennan talked about are probably your antisocial peers, antisocial um, behavior, personality, criminal thinking. Um, you know, obviously we do see substance abuse. It's probably not as prevalent as people think um, on there, but I think that those big four or five are probably the ones we see the most. Okay. Uh, Judge Brickley, uh, are you now seeing needs in your community that weren't previously being addressed? Yes, that's what I was referring to, for example, with our moral recognition therapy. Um, I was seeing over and over the cognitive behavioral need popping up in the pre-sentence reports, and we just didn't have any in our county. So now we've um, started the, the funding process going to get moral recognition, MRT programming in our county. Great. Do you, do you want to chime in at all? You're good? Pardon? Pardon? Did, do you have anything to add to that? Or? Oh, with uh, programming? Um, I was 
So we've been in this process now for over two years, and I also sit on our community corrections board, and we've worked really hard to provide a variety of uh, programming options for the vendors in our community. And I realize um, not every community is lucky, and some actually even have more than we have in Kalamazoo. But we've been able to offer um, a variety of CBT programs, trauma counseling um, for men and women, um, domestic violence counseling, and all of those things are um, meeting the offender's needs. And actually our OCC is taking it one step further, and they're also doing research on it to see the outcomes of how those offenders do on recidivating, which right now at the six month process is actually looking very positive. All right, this next question is for Dr. Brennan. Why do some offenders, such as sex offenders, tend to have very few needs? There's a, there's a group of sex offenders that have very little in the way of criminal background. I mean, it's astounding to look at the criminal histories of these folks and uh, find out that while they have a sex offense, uh, they're holding jobs, they're going to school, they're oftentimes married with family. You know, there's, so there's a paradox here, and uh, it's regarded as a very serious offense. One of the issues that explains that is that that kind of offense is not strongly related to social class. In other words, sex offenders can come from any class, basically. And, um, and so the, the normal high-risk factors that are certainly wrapped up in the socio-cultural aspects of crime, they don't show up in sex offenders at all. And um, once these have been identified um, as, as a sex offender with very low risks, then the issue is obviously what do you do with that person, but there's no surprise that there is a group of sex offenders like that. There's also a group of domestic violence folks like that too. They come from middle class homes and, and you don't have a lot of the, the standard risk factors, and um, they have very little in the way of history. Uh, so, um, what, it's a little bit more complicated though, because other sex, there's another big group of sex offenders with plenty of risks. You know, so in other words, uh, there's no generalized rule on sex offenders. There's different patterns. There's only two main ones, so the ones with very little, other factors and the ones with very high related risk factors. All right, this next question is for, for Laura. Uh, we talked about this a little bit in terms of time. So how has adding uh, compass information into the PSI impacted the time requirements for reports to the court? Well, I would say that um, obviously anytime you add something, you are going to have more time. and. Um, that it takes. We've been doing compass assessments though since I believe it's 2012 on every pre-sentence report. So the agents are used to doing the actual assessment. What they're adding time on right now is the interpretation of those results and that gets faster. Um, with each report that they're doing. We've been doing it for two years now and they seem to have become very accustomed to doing it in their report. I would also say that um, where you're also gaining time is when the conditions match um, to the offender's needs, we've always done case planning. And so their case planning is easily um, mapped out for them at the beginning of probation. So I think that they do gain some time there. Right. Uh, this next question is for Judge Brickley. Are you observing any concerns from the new material that is being added to the PSI report? Say the concerns from the new material? Yes, that's being um, added. No, I can't say. I've, I've, the attorneys haven't noted any. There's been no objections. Um, I haven't, I've never had a concern. I mean, it's more of an interest because it is interesting to go through the grid and, and correlate it with what you how you would describe this person and then to go through and see, well, it just makes sense. Well, the, well this is this issue and this issue and that issue. Um, so I wouldn't call it concerns. I would just call it more, it's more information for us. Okay. Great, thank you. Uh, this next question is for Dr. Brennan. How do you know you are including all the factors necessary to make an informed decision? 
Um, there's, a, there's an old statement in this business, it's called irreducible complexity. And uh, what that means is that there's any number of factors that could impinge upon a case. Now, that takes me back to the one slide I have here of uh, doing all the, the predictive analytic tests. There are hundreds and hundreds of studies. Sometimes there's a technique called meta-analysis that gathers hundreds of studies and finds the most common set and uh, the strength, can always rank order the strongest factors. That's the big four, and then the significant eight of factors. And they're all encompassed, all those ones are encompassed. Why not include other things? Well, it turns out that in 50 years of research, no other factors reach the statistical significance of those factors. And predictive ability is based, I mean, you can measure it with correlation coefficients or regression coefficients or whatever you want to do, but uh, these ones typically come out as the most relevant and the strongest factors. And that's why they're in, you know, most of the new risk needs assessments use the same set of factors. They're the most relevant, the most powerful, and there's a, uh, an emerging uh, set of evaluation studies it used to be called what works, and then it's now now what works with what kind of offender, and then what works with what kind of offender and what kind of situation. And so as that research has become more and more refined, they're, they're really getting to what you should focus on to achieve the greatest impact. And again, these factors that we spoke about earlier are those factors. Other factors, Surprisingly, one like trauma, you know, while trauma has huge impact, it never got into that top eight ever in hundreds and hundreds of studies. It might be super important for a particular subcategory of people. Um, and I see that in my studies of women offenders, particularly prison women offenders, where trauma, particularly the trauma of sexual and physical abuse as children, shows up in a, in a criminal career that ends, you know, they end up in prison. But it doesn't generalize across the whole population of offenders, and these other major factors do. Okay. Does that make sense? Uh, the next question is for, for Laura. Uh, who will be making the supervision recommendation, and how will they be doing that? Does this require some training in local resources? Um, the recommendations um, are being made by probation agents, um, just as they have been um, in the past. So as part of the pre-sentence uh, report, this is going live for all courts um, starting October 9th, I believe. Um, I'm trying to remember the rest. In the training, um, all agents have been trained um, by our lead agents in the Compass. Um, to how to put this in the reports, um, what information needs to be in there, and I believe all that training has now been completed. All right, this next question is for Dr. Brennan. How do you reduce the uncertainty uh, in your decisions for sentencing? Maybe this should. Uh, typically, people want to reduce uncertainty. Uncertainty seems to be the enemy in medical diagnosis. I mean, I was amazed to find that uh, Errors in medical diagnosis discovered through autopsies are around 50, sorry, 40 percent. And so all professions that involve decision making, uncertainty is the biggest, uh, the biggest fear and the biggest challenge. Now in this business, how do you reduce uncertainty? Well, you reduce uncertainty by getting the most relevant information. Like I said before, if your baseline is a flip of a coin, heads, tails, yes, no, in, out, then you've got to beat that 50-50 somehow. How do you do that? Well, if you add the number of priors, you're going to get beyond 50%. If you add who does he hang out with, even further. And so the, the most refined uh, assessments nowadays are trying to add the most relevant pieces of information to build up the background information you have that tells you this guy is a higher and higher and higher risk. And typically, it goes on with the number of key factors that you find in that person. Now, that's converging with a whole other way of dealing with this, which is called um, um, kind making or uh, decision trees. When you take a decision tree and it's 50-50 at the top, and then you find the most predictive factor, yes or no, 
one branch goes down the tree. If you find another predictive factor, that branch gets refined and refined and refined. And you end up with decision trees. At the bottom of that tree, you've got groups that are highly differentiated away from 50-50. You're having no impact if all we can get is 50-50. So information is critical. The relevant information is critical. And clutter is deadly. <laughs> in other words, you can allow clutter into your, into your uh, case. And what that's going to do is confuse things, introduce irrelevant information. And so that's another one of the reasons why that research was so powerful for us, is that it also indicated what is clutter. And um, you'd be surprising that the number of factors that just disappeared away. A lot of the psychiatric categories just disappeared away because they added no incremental accuracy to the predictive decisions. Uh, Judge, is there anything you'd like to add to that uh, as it comes to uncertainty in, in the sentencing? Um, no, there's no certainty. <laughs> <laughs> no, um, I mean, th what I like about this compass is it, it gives me a sense of there's more objectivity in it. And as judges, you know, you don't want to sentence someone because you're mad at them or because you have some implicit bias about something. And it, it, as more as you can make it objective, uh, that's helpful for the judge and you know even though the compass you don't always use the compass I mean you may have someone that's got a lot of needs but you opt for whatever reason to give them a straight jail sentence or something because we still have the other focuses of sentencing of, of punishment and uh, protecting others or restoring wholeness to your victim um, but it's just that tool that gives me another level of certainty when I'm imposing sentence that I'm matching the sentence to the needs of this offender, those needs that are most highly, if I can address those needs, I'm most likely to reduce recidivism with this person. I think Dr. Brennan wanted to add something. Yeah, just one final thought on that question. And that takes me to the issue of, is any risk assessment perfect? Well, intuition is not perfect. Analytical procedures are not perfect. Even when you combine the two in a very strong way and you move into the common sense arena or you move into the wisdom arena, even at the wisdom level of these decisions, people, are, people don't hit perfection. They might get up to 90%, 95% correct. But uh, perfection is one of these things in our business, including, say, the, 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 medi the medicine business, where the complexity is just so much that you can never be sure that you've got the exact factors. So there's always a degree of uncertainty, even amongst the most expert decision makers. It gives you some security, as the judge said, when you realize that you've got the coherent factors, you've got the right factors. There's a sense of solid foundation you know, for, for the inclusion of those factors. So that helps a little bit, both in your own expertise and in your own peace of mind. But perfection is. You know, it's, uh, it's not, not always there. Well, thank you, Dr. Brennan. You, you worked right into my next question, so it's almost like we planned this out. Uh, who did the research on the predictive validity of the compass? Uh, was it a third party, and if not, why not? Yeah. Uh, one of the important things with any risk assessment is to ensure that you test it in your local region. So in other words, you here in Michigan have tested compass five or six times in all kind of different ways, which is very, very impressive. The second part of the question is have other people, independent researchers, or well, a group down in um, California, as I showed in one of my slides there, also they studied 25,000 prisoners and they found the exact same kind of results that Michigan was finding. The AUCs were in the 0.7s, and so that's another, what we call an independent study uh, showing that it's not just me or my team or Michigan. New York did the same. They did an independent study with a different group of, of university researchers. And so there's been six or seven of these studies all around the country now with uh, proving that COMPASS does reach these predictive accuracy levels and it generalizes well. G the idea of generalization is that does this stand up to other, in other places and in other kinds of agencies, probation, jail, parole, etc. So 
so you want an instrument that passes that test of independence by the investigators. Another thing that's very important for accepting any kind of test, has it been peer reviewed? Now what peer review means is that you send your manuscript away to some journal, typically if you, if you try to get it to the highest status journal. Now the high status journals have got real tough uh, reviewers. You, it's blind, you don't know who they are, they don't know who you are, and they're gonna do their, um, their due diligence on assessing the scientific quality and the scientific results of this particular instrument. And so Compass also has been peer reviewed several times and uh, it's stood up well to the peer reviews. Okay. Well, let's, let's stay with Dr. Brennan for, for a moment. And you touched on this a little bit in your presentation, but I think there's more to mine here. Um, the question is, um, can you address the criticisms of Compass uh, and its uh, being potentially racially biased? Yeah, the only thing I can do there is acknowledge to you that racial bias clearly seems to be pervade many aspects of, of criminal justice. Therefore, we have to be incredibly diligent to make sure that, say, in, in our system, the risk assessment methods, race uh, is, is not a factor. So yes, you eliminate race. You try to minimize any close, they're not exactly proxies, but they're correlates of race. Poverty would be like that. So then the final acid test is to do the kind of thing that uh, I, I showed you some of the slide results. Does it predict the exact same accuracy or very, very similar accuracy for the different races? And so we've done um, uh, Hispanic, black, white, and you know, certainly that happens in California, happens here, and we find that that equality it's also equality of the two genders. We find that the risk models are, are um, reaching the same accuracy for women. Now, the, the, the parallel lines chart that I showed you is something that uh, several very well-renowned organizations like the American Psychological Association, the American Educational Research Association, these are high status, very, very knowledgeable people about assessment. The educational people have been in assessment for, for 100 years now. They know what they're doing. And that's the method that they recommend as the test for racial parity. And when you see that parallel lines close to each other, that's giving you, my old professor um, in statistics said, it gives you the interocular significance test. In other words, <laughs> you know, it hits you right between the eyes. And so graphs like that and re replicated studies like that are, are a reassurance to us that we're, we're, we're on the right side and close to racial parity. At the same time, you've got to be, you've got to be uh, vigilant. And so we, we are continuing to make sure that, that we stay as vigilant as possible. I will say this at this point in time, Compass now is the most well-tested risk instrument for racial parity because as far as I can see, the only other test like, you know, that has the same intensity of, of uh, scrutiny is the federal, the federal, um, oh, it's, I think it's federal probation or something like that. So it's out of Washington, D.C., and they did the same kind of tests with their new instrument with similar results. Great, and thank you for that interocular. I'm going to use that the next time I talk to reporters. Uh, this question is for Lara. Uh, will, will Compass evaluations still be done in mandatory prison cases or cases with probable uh, prison recommendations? Um, the Compass assessment is done as part of every pre-sentence report. So you're going to still see that needs grid um, for the jail cases, the prison cases. You're going to see um, that there's highly probable, probable, or unlikely needs. The only difference you're going to see is in that supervision recommendation that um, for a prison case, it's going to be, will be assessed upon incarceration. Um, for jail or fines and costs, it's just going to state um, no supervision um, recommended. And then for probation cases, you should see for probable and highly probable needs um, a general recommendation of what um, they will be recommending to meet that need. Okay, 
and we'll stay, we'll stay with you. It's a question which I think might be the last one unless we have any others that are coming uh, through. Uh, what is the process uh, with the Compass interview for offenders who may be illiterate or may have a cognitive impairment? They're illiterate or what? Or, or have a cognitive impairment. Um, so if somebody is illiterate, um, the agent um, is very well versed in being able to ask them that questions. There are a certain amount of self-report that we find that they're more honest on, uh, but those can obviously be asked for the offender. Um, if somebody is cognitively impaired, we do have a pre-screening that we can do. Um, we sometimes find that I think we've had it, I've had maybe one in the two years we've been doing it, or maybe two that have been so mentally ill that they can't answer those questions, and so we would not ask them at that time, and we would explain that in the report. Um, so we do have some options as a department of how to deal with those situations. We would just list it in the report for the judge of why we were doing that. Okay. Great. Do we have any more questions? We're all set. Is there anything that uh, any of the three of you uh, that maybe we, we didn't get to or that you saw, thought of when we were kind of going through our presentations before we, before we take off? Anything else anybody wants to add? <laughs> all, you've all said enough. Well, let's give a hand to our, our three uh, presenters here. And, and just remember that the, the entire presentation uh, will be posted uh, online and we'll, we'll be sending out information about where you can find that. Um, again, I want to thank our presenters. I think we all uh, learned a lot today. Um, and the other thing, too, is that this is a collaborative effort between um, the MDOC, uh, SADO, uh, PAM, the judges. Things, this thing doesn't just get, just doesn't happen. So there's a lot of people that go, that go into this. A big thank you again to the person who doesn't want to be named, uh, Michael Keck, uh, and his team at the MDOC for all of their hard work in putting this together, and also their wise choice in a host. Um, but that, when that person couldn't make it, then they settled on me. Um, also, thanks to uh, Lansing Community College and our auditorium for having us today and for everybody that was watching online. Again, thank you all for coming and have a great rest of your day.